It was a case that spanned two decades. By the time Peter Tobin was found guilty of murdering teenage hitchhiker Dinah McNichol in 2009, He'd already been in prison for two years. He was serving life sentences for the murders of Angelica Kluke and 15-year-old schoolgirl Vicky Hamilton. The 63-year-old serial killer and rapist had buried all three girls across a 15-year period, one in Scotland and two on the south coast of England. Another awful discovery at 50 Irvine Drive. A body bag thought to contain the remains of Dinah McNichol brought out from what was the most ordinary of houses. It is no longer. I think what sets Tobin apart for me is the, the sheer relentless brutality of him. A man who genuinely paid no attention whatever to anything but his own basest instinct. He did what he wanted, when he wanted, and could get away with it. Former Detective Superintendent David Swindle from Strathclyde Police first came across Tobin after the body of Angelica Kluke was discovered at St Patrick's Church in Glasgow in 2006. The 23-year-old Polish student had been missing for five days. Coming back to the church today brings it all back to me. The horrors, the horrors of what must have happened here. Unbelievable. You could never imagine it. A place of worship desecrated by Peter Tobin doing what he did to Angelica Cluck. But when they arrested Tobin, police were convinced this wasn't his first murder. David set up Operation Anagram, a task force charged with finding out more about the life and crimes of Peter Tobin. When we looked at his life in Operation Anagram, we found that he frequented places like this, churches, religious establishment, homeless persons, hostels. How many people frequented the places that Tobin frequented. How many people did he meet that were vulnerable at that time that had no relatives to report them missing? How many of these were missing and were never reported missing that Tobin has killed? We'll never know. Tobin knows the answer. Throughout his life, Tobin, who was born and brought up a Catholic, had a persistent connection with the Catholic Church and at various points during his periods on the run or disappearing or adopting false identities took refuge in uh, Catholic churches and Catholic communities. I think it was simply that that was somewhere where he felt comfortable, where he knew how it, to conduct himself, where he could hide in plain sight. He could conceal his true nature behind the facade of church handyman or a member of a Christian community and that was a very safe way to conceal the reality of what he wanted. To Tobin nothing was sacred. He took advantage of the open nature of the Currens and the community of St Patrick's. He was with us maybe about six, seven weeks, something like that. And then he started giving Father Jerry a hand in the church and he's doing bits and pieces. People don't understand you can be with somebody a full day and they never spoke. You know what I mean? People find that hard to understand. There's nothing to sort of, uh, it was a yes and no. That's what it was, a yes and a no. Peter Tobin was an incredibly manipulative individual. He wasn't particularly emotionally complex himself, but he had a really good understanding of other people's emotions. He knew what other people needed to hear and he used that to get what he wanted. Cathy, however, had concern for the ominous stranger who joined their community. I says to Dennis that there was something far wrong with them. I, I wasn't too sure what it was, but as far as I could understand, that the jigsaw with Pat McLaughlin was no fitting together. There was something not right there. But Tobin's next step was more evil than any of them could have predicted. Angelika Kluk was a 23-year-old student from Skotsau near Krakow in Poland who was working as a cleaner in St. Patrick's Church. On the 24th of September 2006, she disappeared. Dennis broke the news to his wife. He said, that girl, Angelika Kluk, we don't know where she is. And I went, what do you mean? He said, she's vanished. All her stuff's there, all her credit cards and everything are all up in their room, but she's 
vanished. Police scoured the church and grounds for evidence and began interviewing members of the community. They discovered that the last person seen with Angelica was the church handyman, a man named Pat McLaughlin. Charity worker Dennis provided police with a photograph of McLaughlin. At six o'clock it went in the evening news nationwide and within minutes the phone line was jammed to say that's not Pat McLaughlin, that's Peter Tobin. Police now had their main suspect. They quickly discovered that Tobin had a violent past and the investigation escalated at rapid speed. David Swindle was the lead detective on the case. I became involved in the investigation when it was established that Peter Tobin, a missing sex offender, had been with Angelica Kluck. And soon after my involvement, I arranged for the church to be searched again by specialist officers and specialist teams. There's a garage attached to the church, and that is where Peter Tobin was with Angelica Kluck working on some woodwork. He called her his little apprentice. He actually was interviewed by a police officer when the missing person report was made, and he stayed there for another day. When the heat was on, he left. When he realised it was being treated as a major investigation, he left. This is someone that was cool and calculated. Police launched a nationwide search for Peter Tobin. Mr Tobin is considered a potential risk to members of the public. Any person who sees this man is advised not to approach him. It was a name that sounded all too familiar to crime journalist Martin Brunt. It was a shock to find what had happened, but what made it particularly interesting for crime reporters who were covering the case was that police were appealing for a man called Peter Tobin, and it rang bells. It took me and others back to the days of 1993. They didn't realise that he was, in reality, Peter Tobin with a dreadful history of sex crimes. He was a man hiding in that community under a false name, had duped the church authorities to employ him as a handyman, and of course they were completely innocent of his background. As the search for Angelica intensified, it became more and more likely she wouldn't be found alive. We had another search of the church, a really thorough search, because by this time, the parameters had changed. There was concern for her safety. Five days after her disappearance, on the 29th of September 2006, police discovered the body of Angelica Kluke under the floorboards of St Patrick's Church. She'd suffered severe head injuries and multiple stab wounds after being attacked in the adjoining garage. It was in there just after the priest Father Jerry left on that Sunday. Within minutes of it, someone across the road had heard a scream. He hit her over the head with a table leg. There were splinters in her head, rendered her unconscious or semi-conscious, bound her hands with cable ties, further assaulted her, dragged her in a polythene sheet into the church here and across the church and put her body under the floor like a bag of rubbish. She was put under there he stabbed her, whether that happened underneath there or whether it happened outside, and he raped her. He left her dead. The British public was shocked to learn the truth of where Angelica's body had been hidden since her violent death. This should have been a day of worship here at St Patrick's Church, but instead the building remains a crime scene, sealed off and guarded by police. And today brought the news that the people who laid those floral tributes were expecting but dreading that the body found hidden underneath the floorboards here was indeed that of the missing Polish student. I think the discovery of Angelica's body was awful enough that a young woman had died in those circumstances, the fact that she was buried under a church added some sense of horror and drama to the way people reacted to it. The fact that a suspect was somebody who had been working at the church, somebody who seemingly had volunteered to be a handyman, 
that the church didn't really make sense. DNA evidence on Angelica's body was confirmed as belonging to Peter Tobin, and his fingerprints were found on the tarpaulin he used to wrap her in. In forensic pathology, we have what's called low cards exchange principle. That says that when you interact with another person, you leave something of yourself on them, and you take something of them away with you. Anyone who murders another person who physically interacts with them, they will leave trace evidence. They will leave DNA, potentially fibres, hairs, all sorts of things. But Peter Tobin continued to elude the authorities. Despite a nationwide search, he disappeared into thin air. So things were moving very fast. We have the human remains of a young woman who's been ferociously attacked. Horrible, horrible scene underneath the floorboards. Forensic examination is ongoing. We knew by this time that Peter Tobin had a history of violence, sexual crimes. He had been in prison. He was a dangerous person. Where was he? David and his team wouldn't have to wait long for an answer. In early October, just over a week since Angelica's murder, they received a crucial breakthrough. Tobin had been spotted, this time using another alias, James Kelly, over 400 miles away. They got a phone call from the police in London that he had checked into a hospital in a false name. Someone had recognised him. A Metropolitan Police officer went in there and confirmed his identity. And I arranged for a team of uniform officers to bring him back to Scotland. Sinclair was born in Glasgow in the post-war years, and, and this was a time of real change and real upheaval for the city. There was a lot of poverty and there was quite a significant gang culture, so violence was part and parcel of everyday life for many young men. Angus had two older siblings, a brother and a sister, but this didn't stop him from being picked on. He was the runt of the litter, but he was also small. By the time he'd reached puberty, he was constantly being bullied, knocked about, thrown about. Tragically, Sinclair's father died when he was just four years old. I think that certainly increased his feeling of depression, of being an outsider, of not being like everybody else. And he chose to identify with petty theft and petty crime as his revolt against the world. In 1959, when Sinclair was just a young teen, he committed his first offence. He was only 13 when he stole the offer tray box at the local church, and that uh, led to him uh, having a criminal conviction. At the same time, he became preoccupied with sex. Now, the early sexualisation of young men is a clue to problems later on and we start to see this pattern in Angus Sinclair. By the age of 15, Sinclair's bad behaviour escalated and became increasingly violent. He viciously attacked an eight-year-old girl. If there was a trigger to the career that he then went on to found as a rapist and a murderer, 1961 was probably the moment in which it started, because later in the year, he committed the first serious attack on a neighbour, young girl, uh, near, lived nearby. On July the 1st, Sinclair was home alone when he decided to strike again. This time, the victim was a child who lived in a neighbouring flat in the tenement block, seven-year-old Catherine. He's 16 at the time, and th there's, there's quite a lot of respect amongst children for older children. So he asks her to run an errand for him, and, and she goes out and she does it. Now, when she comes back, he attacks her. Sinclair took the girl up to his flat, where he viciously assaulted her. Then, in the middle of his heinous act, he suddenly stopped. There's a knock at the door, and he just literally stops what he's doing and goes and answers the door and sends the neighbour away. Sinclair got rid of the visitor and went back to attacking the girl. He raped her, he killed her, using a ligature from a bicycle in a bicycle tube. It's a vicious, premeditated, calculating, callous attack. 
on an utterly innocent young girl. The callous killer quickly came up with a plan to dispose of the child's body. I think most 16-year-olds would panic, but what he did was he sorted out her lower clothing to try to hide the fact that it had been a sexual attack. He rolled her body down the stairs and he, he left it there to be found, obviously hoping that it would look as though she had fallen downstairs and, and, and injured herself. Left at the bottom of the communal staircase inside the tenement block, Catherine was quickly found by neighbours. By the following day, she was confirmed dead. Forensic testing was still in its infancy at the time, but with such key evidence, scientists hoped their analysis could help pinpoint the killer. Now, blood grouping on these materials should be fairly straightforward when it's that fresh, but it actually proved quite difficult to get good, clear results on, so we had to kind of abandon those results. We weren't able to get terribly clear results on that. Scientists at the time could not help the police find the culprits, now branded the world's end killers by the press. Lester Nib and the team at the lab held on to the samples in the hope that future advancements in forensic technology would later solve the case. Relatively early in 1978 that the police kind of drew a, a close. We produced a report, an interim report, to keep the police up to date with what we'd found. And effectively all the, the exhibits were taken away for storage by the police. But just over a year after the World's End murders, Sinclair struck again. On November the 19th, 1978, he was prowling near Barnhill Station in the suburbs of Glasgow. There he spotted a target, a petite 17-year-old machinist called Mary Gallagher. Mary Gallagher was in her late teens, but the significant thing about Mary is that she was tiny. She looked like a child. Mary Gallagher was going to meet her friend over the other side of the railway tracks and her mother saw her set out, her, her sister saw her set out as well. Mary was last seen leaving her home at 6.45pm. Sinclair threatened Mary with a knife. He demanded that she took her clothes off and he slit her throat with a knife. This was a really, really nasty attack. It would take more than 20 years to prove that Sinclair was Mary's killer. Meanwhile, he continued to commit a catalogue of cruel offences. One of the extraordinary things about Sinclair was known to the police. He had a reputation as a mugger. At one point, he got a handgun conviction. They knew he was a violent man, but they didn't connect the dots. Sinclair was a man who got away with it for a very long time. Between 1978 and 1982, a total of 11 children reported being sexually assaulted by Sinclair. Over a number of years, we think exclusively targeted children because there aren't any unsolved rapes or rapes and murders of that time from about 1978 to 1982 that match his MO. Sinclair would ask them to run an errand for him and then when they returned, he would attack them. Sinclair used his job as a painter and decorator as cover for his despicable deeds. In 1982, Sinclair was finally caught out. In June, Sinclair was in the Woodlands area of Glasgow where he assaulted a six-year-old girl. But this time, the alert child was able to identify her attacker. One girl, six-year-old girl, who he carried out a really serious sexual assault on, recognised the smell of turpentine on him. He was dressed as a painter and flecks of paint were on his hair and shoes. Sinclair, now aged 37, was arrested and subsequently stood trial at Edinburgh's High Court. On August the 31st, 1982, he was convicted of three charges of rape, seven charges of lewd and libidinous practices and a breach of the peace. The Crown decided to take a very, very simple approach to the case. They decided not to bother with all the supporting evidence, the hairs and fibers, the knots, nothing like that. They decided just to go on the simple, straightforward DNA. Here is a girl that's been murdered. Here is her coat. On that coat is DNA, and the DNA belongs to Angus Sinclair. End of story. Sinclair and his lawyers saw a chance to deny the murder. Eventually, in 2004, the DNA evidence points conclusively to Sinclair as 
part of the world's end killings. Sinclair stands trial, but comes up with what to him, I'm sure, seemed a perfect defence. Oh, yes, I am. Oh, well, I mean, this DNA proves I had sex with uh, Christine and Helen after the world's end. But, of course, it was entirely consensual. And when I left them with my brother-in-law, Gordon, uh, they were alive and well and, as far as I was aware, in fine spirits. It was all Gordon's fault. That was his defence. Sinclair's testimony was enough to prove reasonable doubt. The judge decided that because of the suggestion of consensual sex, then that the whole of the DNA evidence which was being put forward by the Crown was no longer relevant. None of the supporting evidence had been included by the Crown, and therefore the case fell in 2007. Without any other forensic evidence, Judge Lord Clark threw the case out. It was one of the worst days of my life. I mean, I, I can remember it distinctly yet. Yeah, it was just this sense of total disbelief. The families of Helen and Christine had been waiting 30 years for justice. Helen Scott's father was there that day. Absolutely shattered. Uh, what's going to explain how I feel? 30 years of trying to get a conclusion. The decision also sent shockwaves across Scotland. When the trial collapsed, a lot of journalists, politicians, and significantly the Lord Advocate themselves, who's in charge of all prosecutions in Scotland, said, whoa, stop. Something about this isn't right. And that started a pretty root and branch review of the justice system particularly when it comes to double jeopardy. Scotland was one of the last countries in Western Europe to have a law that stated you could not be tried for the same crime twice. It was overhauled in the wake of the 2007 trial. So the law changed, and then Angus Sinclair was the first person to be retried under the double jeopardy legislation. When the go-ahead for the second trial was given, came out of the court and I, I phoned my dad straight away to tell him. It wasn't about celebrating. None of this has ever been about celebrating. But what it did do was just give that opportunity to bring this chapter to an end. On the 13th of October 2014, 69-year-old Angus Sinclair stood trial again for the murders of two 17-year-old friends, Helen Scott and Christine Eady. This time, the Crown prosecutors used all the latest forensic technology to make their case. The trial lasted weeks, attended every day, and this time, the Crown got it absolutely right. I mean, that was compelling evidence from knots to soil samples to DNA to just a whole picture was put together. Exactly what should have happened in 2007 and didn't. And the jury convicted him unanimously. There was no question whatsoever. Scotland 2001. Robert Black, a Scottish paedophile and serial killer, had attacked children across the UK. He was responsible for the rape, kidnap and sexual assault of young girls from the late 1950s onwards. This nightmare of um, abduction and sexual assault and murder of um, innocence, um, just wee girls is, is particularly horrific. Black was finally arrested in 1990 after trying to snatch a young girl in broad daylight. He was eventually convicted of four child murders between 1981 and 1986. His youngest victim was only five years old. I think the impact of the Robert Black case on the community and on the nation was pretty devastating. This was the end of the idea of, of the innocence of childhood. After the Black case, I think parents started putting more restrictions on their children's freedom. Pat Cardy's nine-year-old daughter, Jennifer, was abducted and murdered by Black in 1981. 
but it would take several years before she knew who was responsible for killing her daughter. We still miss, miss her, particularly our two boys when she was taken. How hard, how difficult, how heavy it was upon them, not understanding anything, but just knowing that she would never be there again. That was brutal. Journalist Tim Tate investigated Black's life in the hope of discovering why he did what he did. They were terrible crimes. He probably killed more children than any other convicted child sex serial killer in Britain. This killer's story begins in 1947. Robert Black was born on the 21st of April in Grangemouth, about 20 miles from Edinburgh, Scotland. Robert Black's mother was unmarried at the time. There was a real stigma around illegitimacy, so he was given up. Now, his mother went on to get married and to have four other children, but she never, ever wanted anything to do with Robert Black. So right from the outset, this is, is somebody who's facing rejection and exclusion. He's somebody who has come into the world with a stigma on him. Black was fostered by Jack and Margaret Tulip, who lived in a remote Western Scottish village. They were in their mid-50s. They had no previous experience. They were strict, they were God-fearing, and he's never given their name. He's always Robert Black, something that would have marked him out at the time in that small community. Black later alleged that his foster parents were abusive towards him. The foster father died when he was five, but the foster mother uh, continued the abusive behavior that had been perpetrated beforehand. So he was beaten when he wet the bed. Here is somebody who does not have a, a safe or a secure home environment. This is uh, a young boy who has got no comfort from anybody whatsoever. From this disturbed upbringing, Black unsurprisingly rebelled and developed an unhealthy interest in other children. By the age of eight, he started offending. He's already developed sexualized behavior. He's taking the time and the trouble to peer up little girls' skirts. He has molested, that's putting it gently, a baby. And he's begun to explore bodily orifices. This is the obsession that will be with him all his life. In August 1981, after murdering nine-year-old Jennifer Cardi, Robert Black left the country and returned to work. Black continued to present to the world the same affable, big, softy exterior that he'd done throughout. Drove back, went about his business. It wasn't for another year, almost, until he struck again. While he was driving his van, he was always on the lookout. Uh, for his next victim. And he had in the back of his van what can only be described as a, an abduction kit. He had bindings, he had um, this sack which he would put the child in. On the 30th of July, 1982, Black was on a delivery job in Northumberland, northeast England, near to the village of Coldstream, where a young schoolgirl was leaving her house to go and play with her friends. Susan Maxwell is 11. She lives with her mum and her stepdad and their children in a little village. It's a happy, warm, loving home. It's a summer, it's afternoon. Susan says she wants to go and play tennis with her friend and it's agreed that Susan will walk home. The tragic, tragic irony is that she encounters none other than Robert Black and his van. She had begun walking home, and at some point after 4.30, which is the last time anyone saw her, she was snatched, literally snatched, put in the black of Black's van and driven away. Susan's mother had changed her mind about letting Susan walk home and decided to pick her daughter up but there was no sign of her anywhere, and she called the police. Tom Wood was the detective inspector at the Lothian and Borders Serious Crime Squad. 
we were sent down to the borders straight away to help with the investigation. And there were huge searches made uh, off the area because we thought that um, she might have been thrown over the bridge or fallen over the bridge or, or might have come to harm locally. On the 12th of August, a body was found near a village in a lay-by in the West Midlands, over 200 miles from where Susan had been abducted. It was the middle of the summer, and so the body was badly decomposed to the extent it was some time before we discovered that it was actually Susan. That made it impossible for the coroner to determine an exact cause of death. Susan was found partially clothed, indicating that she'd been sexually assaulted. The police were desperate to find the person responsible for such a heinous act. Black was extraordinarily careful. This wasn't an out-of-control, spur-of-the-moment decision to abduct a child. He planned this. He spent hours, days, looking for suitable victims well, Black's modus operandi was fairly simple, similar to almost every pedophile that I've examined. He would drive around, he would look for a child. The child had to have two sets of characteristics that was physical, that had to do with his fixation. And that second criteria was that, that no adults had to be near that child or nearby responsible for taking care of that child. He would rehearse, he would drive round and round, even if he saw a child who he thought matched his image of an ideal victim. He wouldn't abduct straight away. He would monitor, he would look for escape routes, and only when everything was perfect would he pounce. For Robert Black, these girls were essentially disposable objects. He would abduct them in these blitz attacks off the streets. He'd abuse them, and then he would just discard them. He, he really was the, the most remorseless offender. Robert Black had now killed four young girls in just over four and a half years. His appetite for abducting, abusing, and murdering young children would only intensify. The police had connected the murders of three of the young victims, but they were no closer to catching the killer. But a chance encounter would soon change everything. In July 1990, Black is still driving his van. And this time, he returns to the borders of Scotland, a little town called Stowe. A retired post office worker is mowing his lawn when he sees a van pull up. He also sees a young girl walk past the van, and then he sees the young girl lifted up and whisked into the van. With great presence of mind, this, this uh, guy noted the number of this van uh, accurately and immediately phoned the police. Uh, the police attended, and as they were standing uh, discussing the issue on this little road in Stout, Black drives back down the same road where the same post office worker shouts, that's the van. And it is the same van, and it is black driving it. A policeman stepped out, stopped the van, then detained the driver, um, and then searched the van, first found nothing, and then found the wee girl lying in the bottom of the van uh, in a bag, semi-suffocated. And the man who opens the back doors of the van is the little girl's father, who's a policeman. Can you imagine what impact that must have had on him? There can be no doubt that it was Black's overconfidence, his arrogance, to do something so outrageous in broad daylight in a tiny Scottish town, and what's more then, to drive back down the same road in which he's abducted. And thankfully, the little girl is still alive. She's been sexually assaulted, but she's escaped with her life. It's important to understand that a serial killer of the kind that Black was, he, he was a, an obsessed serial killer, not an incidental serial killer. He, he was destined to kill over and over and over again. Had he not have been caught that day, that girl would have died and many others would have died. Now, immediately Robert Black was arrested for that. Um, literally within the hour, 
we knew this was the man we were looking for because the, 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 the modus operandi was, was, so, was so identical. On the 10th of August 1990, Black pleaded guilty to the abduction and sexual abuse of the six-year-old girl in Stowe. He was given a life sentence and was sent to Salton Prison in Edinburgh. <laughs>